everyone. Just a couple of minutes. I'm launching the showreel of the special guest of today. A couple of minutes and I'll invite him to join this amazing live. You can ask anything about the VFX world. Any fan of Game of Thrones here? I just do a quick introduction about Horunur. Horunur Raf Narson, visual effects supervisor for Reykjavik Island. He created all the visual effects for the island region because in this work we will go in depth, work with a lot of people. We will dive in, in this and also in other works. He's an experience in visual effects in the past 12, uh, 18 years, sorry, in various roles, primarily as a visual effects supervisor and compositor, and worked in Game of Thrones, Black Mirror, Frame Store, MPC, Swiss, HBO, Netflix, Pegasus, True North, and many more. I think it's time to invite him to join this live. Use the question mark below, guys, to, to ask anything. I will pin the most relevant question. Hey! Hello! Hello man. I'm good. Welcome. Welcome on our live. People is waiting to see you and to hear your voice. Yeah, thanks for having me. Finally, we, we do it, eh? Yeah, thank you so much, really. And, mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, we collected a lot of questions about you, but... Uh, the, the aim of the live is always to tell more about your story. Mm -hmm. Genuinely, we would love to know more about you. Mm -hmm. When and how you started this amazing journey in the VFX world? Yeah, it started, I guess, around uh, 95. With, um, I started to get involved with uh, Photoshop, actually, through like uh, multimedia and the first Photoshop I touched was actually 1.0, um, no layers, you know, just like very, old very, <laughs> very basic stuff. You know, I still kind of like the, the old school Photoshop and I don't use any of the new features really. So, uh, um, but yeah, I, then, then I got involved with a fairly big agency in um, Copenhagen called Bates, which is an international agency. And at that time, the whole multimedia craze was really going crazy. So that kind of my Photoshop skills kind of uh, had just come out a, a couple of years later. And, and like, so, so it slowly evolved from maybe being more graphical, uh, like the first six, seven, eight years maybe to uh, going around 2000 I start focusing on VFX really. Uh, it was a passion from ever? From, uh... Yeah, I mean I, I, you know, when I started there was some animation schools there was some multimedia schools there was some 3D schools and stuff like that, but there was no like VFX hadn't been defined. It was nowhere close yeah. to being defined, really. So uh, in in this business, uh, uh, two Icelandic guys called Aaron Aaron uh, Hjartason, which is uh, the creative director of uh, Frame Store LA now, and um, Tade Einarsson, who uh, was um, at at that time when I got to know them, they were both working at the mill. Um, but uh, that then get, went on to work uh, a lot with the frame with Framestore for many many years. And he then hired me actually much later, and I worked for Framestore uh, like almost five years. Um, so um, yeah, they, that kind of they kind of showed me. I got a really good insight to this crazy new thing called visual effects, you know, and I thought it was amazing. So. I yeah. just had, had to be a part of it, you know, so. In your experience, so you suggest to, to enroll some specific, in every time, the same question, mm -hmm. film mm -hmm. school or not, so or yeah. directly in some specific place or follow mm -hmm. some specific people? I would say there's no right or wrong, but I would definitely say there's very good schools out there that give you a head start, I would say, you know, so. Yeah. So definitely, if you have the opportunity to 
take advantage of that. I would definitely recommend that. And having done a little bit of teaching myself, you know, I, I think it's uh, it's a great place for you also just to like without the pressures of the business, you can really like try out your creativity and and maybe test out if it's really the thing for you because it's not for everyone um, like the stress levels the the amount of work and stuff like that um, but also some people actually find out that they they don't actually they don't like the creative part they like the uh, the uh, technical part of it and then maybe they should maybe pursue something more technical or you know, so so I think schools are in general good, and there's many really good schools I've noticed. So uh, I'm not an expert at all. Which school? Don't ask. I mean, I know that for example, Campus 18 in Sweden. I've worked with many of their students, and they're always good. I always like I'm impressed how how far along they are um, after after that at newly graduates and. There's like a escape, like there's so many options today and so many universities as well that do a great job, I'm sure. So. Okay. Yeah. There's some question about teamwork. So mm -hmm. I also would love to, to know more about the relationship between the different roles in a, a TV series, for example, like Game mm -hmm. of Thrones. Mm -hmm. If you have a directly relationship with the director, the DP, mm -hmm. uh, I remember you working directly with some DP for the Iceland region. Tell us more about uh, teamwork in general and specifically your role with specific role. In the yeah, team. I mean, uh, it, it, it could, I mean, I, I would be happy, for example, if we take Game of Thrones. Um, so the way. Game of Thrones comes about is that there is a production company here in uh, in uh, Iceland called Pegasus, <clears throat> which I've had a production company servicing HBO for Game of Thrones for all the basically north of the wall is Iceland, you know. So principal uh, uh, shoots uh, took place on various glaciers here in Iceland, and and also there is I think it's season five or four, where they take summer scenes in, in uh, Iceland for the for the hound and, and the girl. I'm not, I'm actually not a very good uh, Game of Thrones fan myself. I haven't watched it except my work, you know, so uh, uh, I, I, forgive me with the names, but the hound and the girl is traveling uh, through a, a quite, quite a uh, big part of the uh, season. Uh, I think it's season five if i'm not mistaken and that was shot in the summer in iceland um but uh, yeah came, uh, pegasus uh, they're they're kind of uh, expanding their scope here in iceland and so on and i just basically just went for for a handshake with steve Hulback, who was the the uh, head um, vfx producer for hbo and uh, Steve was kind enough to take the time to meet me between a rare, very tight uh, shooting schedule. And we had a beer together and talked just general, like general VFX business. And um, and then he said, yeah, well, if something comes up, uh, maybe two years or something. And then um, this was season five. They were supposed to come to Iceland and... Uh, and shoot on a very unique beach here in Iceland, but they had some uh, constraint, both scheduling and budget-wise, I think, which made it difficult for them to go to do principal uh, photography in Iceland. So they were kind of um, kind of tossing around what they could because they really fell in love with the beats and the look of the beats, and they really wanted that for their heart at home. Um, a battle sequence um, where they're landing. I think it's season five where they're coming in on boats and landing on the end of uh, doing some uh, uh, plate shoots, doing a lot of plate shoots, and then also doing some uh, 3D photogrammetry scanning. 
uh, which was really, you know, we were really taking our first steps into that. I've, I had done quite a bit before that, but all fairly small scale compared to now we're doing it in many kilometers scale, you know, so... So um, it was fairly uh, nerve-wracking, but uh, the guy like Joe Bauer, the, the head supervisor of Game of Thrones, the main supervisor and my boss there, he, uh, him and Steve said, okay, it sounds like, like a, a viable plan. If, you, if you're up for it, go for it and let's see what happens. They really took a chance both with me and with the plan and, and it, worked out really well so um we were we were all pretty happy with that and that fin finale was really well uh, received critically and so on so and I, they got their emmy which they have like closets full of emmys now with, yeah. for vfx you know so so you you couldn't really ask for more uh, back for season seven where um where I worked really closely with Ted Ray, which was one of the principal supervisors as well, who was mainly um, overseeing plate shooting. So for the Frozen Lake sequence, we went looking like uh, scouting in helicopters and looking everywhere to find the perfect frozen lake for that battle. And, and uh, searching the helicopters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yeah and here, it's not <laughs> the perfect place to... No, yeah, yeah. And this is, uh, we, we exactly, the pilot there is an absolute legend in Iceland called the old Jón Kjartans, uh, also called the Blade or Spaden in Icelandic, because uh, he, uh, he flies in such tight, uh, tight spaces that the blades almost touch uh, the cliffs, as you can see. Um, <laughs> yeah, but he, he is amazing. He is like one of the best pilots in the world. So I, you, need, I need to visit the <laughs> yeah, well, explored all the north, but I missed the Iceland. Yeah, well, if if you if you if you come to Iceland, I'll give uh, Jona a call and see if he yeah can, absolutely he can give you a special deal or something. Um, but um, yeah, so you know when I and this is how I work a lot now is I go with Jona and I also go with a. Producer called uh, uh, El Lentur or Eli Casada, who works for Pegasus. Uh, this we three do a lot of work together with the scanning stuff, and we actually just we know we are, we're going for maybe two or three targets that we know, and we've researched and all that. But then we we use all the time that we have for the helicopter and hunt for stuff, you know, and. It's amazing what we get, you know, and Iceland is really, really absolutely unbelievable when it comes to the amount of amazing landscapes that you can find, especially if you're in a helicopter and you can go far yeah. in, into the highlands, you have no limits, really. Um, so the other way I work a lot as well is to do drones, of course, but then I usually need uh, the octocopter, the big drones. Um and when we do drones, that means that we need to drive into really difficult areas usually, which means that we need to hire super jeeps, which are quite expensive, and then we need to stay a night and so on. So quite often it's cheaper to do the helicopter than yeah. actually doing the drone stuff, you know. So um, And it's, it's more two flexible. Different, two different usage every time. Because exactly. We, yeah. And there's a... A battle, <laughs> yeah. Drone and helicopter, but exactly. two different. Yeah, and and with like Game of Thrones, it's like we're also shooting plates. We have a shot over on on the nose of the, of the helicopter, which uh, Ellie is actually a DOP as well. The Ellie, my producer friend, so he has uh, for Game of Thrones always been operating that shot over, and then you you might have like Ted Ray or me sitting next to him. Um, and like uh, directing the plate shoot basically, uh, but like in the in the um, shooting plates, and I was in the front seat with uh, Jon Kerta, the pilot, sh scanning the the areas. You know, so uh, 
Um, we really utilize, I mean, there's no waste of money or, or uh, time or whatever. It's a little bit of a myth. People often think that Hollywood level or top level or like this kind of level is, is wasteful for, with money. Of course, there is maybe examples of that. But usually the standout stuff, the stuff that you think is really impressive, that we have, you know, so we get the Absolutely. most. Yeah. So. People think people think always wrong, big budget, too easy, everything. Yeah, yeah. It's not. No. It's a big mistake. Yeah, also yeah. Today I read some comments in this way, but uh, yeah, it's not. Uh, no, no. Uh, uh, people are always looking at the money, and and of course sometimes it's it's annoys you as a creative person or as the the people that are, as a part of the crew. But most of the time, you can you you understand the logic and, and understand that if I if I get this extra nice kit here, then that means that I might have to do something in two days less in another place or yeah. something, you know. So it it always kind of balancing balances out, I think. Um, and for example, like Game of Thrones, like Chris Newman, who who is a great friend of Iceland in general. He is one of the main producers of Game of Thrones. Like, I've been alone with Chris Newman walking three kilometers in snow or, or two kilometers in snow, and he's carrying like a heavy tripod. And I, and it's nobody like this is one of yeah. the big, biggest producers in TV world today, you know. And it's just me and him uh, carrying uh, our gear because we need to shoot a plate somewhere, you know. So, uh, And that's also fun, you know. You don't want to, yeah. you don't, you still want to be the guy making, making the stuff, you know. So absolutely, so without some fun, it's impossible yeah. to run a, a long time career with mm -hmm. the, the same passion, the same energy. Yeah, no, I would definitely say if 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 you're going into visual effects for the money, then stay out, yeah. you know. Come for the <laughs> come for the lifestyle, the fun. For the passion for the work, you know, for the final limits, you know, that's why you should go into it uh, because it's one of the hardest ways to make money. I'm not saying that you can't make money. You can make money, but the the effort, if it's just for making money, that's, I don't think it was it, you know, it's... I think know, in every work, it's not a good mindset. No, 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 make true. I agree. Money. Mm -hmm. Salute to that, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Salute, uh, grazie. Mm. Uh, we received. The, uh, I want only link a question about this. How is changing the whole industry and also the VFX industry with this actual situation, the COVID situation? Mm -hmm. It's and really. What are your, your vision about this? Yeah, it's it, it's really weird, you know. I mean, I I can't talk for the industry but I can talk for me and for me it's meant more work than than rather than less work you know because uh, the productions that I am involved with are trying to find ways to finish stuff without in a non-normal way they can't do the plan that they thought they were going to do so now they're trying to find a new plan And now they're asking if maybe visual effects can do more, you know, can we do more yeah. in the computer? Can we do more with, I have a, a great partnership with a Swiss in Stockholm, for example, who I've worked with for over 10 years now. And they are not allowed to go anywhere because they're the dirty Swedes, you know, they're the most COVID infected uh, Swedish <laughs> people now, you know, so which is kind of hilarious, you know, because Swedes, Swedes are usually the best at everything, you know, but this time they, they, they're not very popular at least. So, so now I have to go supervise for them uh, various, or they have asked me to go and I'm happy to go. So, um, uh, so, so like that, that's something because I'm from Iceland and we're on the uh, A list. So, so I, I think Iceland is one of the countries one of the citizens that can travel the most in the world now. So I, so they, uh, they're happy uh, to, to ask me to go instead. So, which I am, am doing a bit for them uh, like that. So, 
Uh, but yeah, it's really, really weird. And I can imagine like the big, big productions is it's really hard times. I mean, but I, really all I hear my, from the people I'm uh, involved with, which is maybe, of course, more on the supervisor, uh, the effects producer level, everybody is more busy, not less busy because yeah. of COVID, you know. So let's hope it trickles down to the... Uh, uh, Art, to the uh, l uh, artist in post-production as well, so which is a problem, you know. Um, uh, I mean, that's going to be difficult. But I can imagine like Framestore and MPC and these kind of companies are having a really hard time, you know, because they just need to keep getting those yeah. big, big movies all the time, you know. So. Yeah. <clears throat> The, the, the also the theater experience is yeah, now yeah, yeah that's what is down so yeah it's, yeah it's hard also to plan amazing new things in this yeah way. for sure i mean maybe maybe a new season of game of thrones <laughs> yeah 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 well you know there's some spin-off series or not spin-offs but kind of a inspired series on the way i think so uh so, but that, like, that's also the other thing is like, for example, uh, Netflix and, and other streaming uh, services are green lighting like uh, at a rate never seen before, you know, because so they need to re refresh their catalog. So, so all, all at least good projects are being green lighted now. So that's also uh, makes a guy like me quite busy, you know, um, because I, of course I'm involved in pre-production and stuff. Was the artist like if you're a compositor or a three D guy or something, then then you're probably in a little bit of trouble right now because it's not reaching post post till quite quite far down the line. Maybe let's hope like, like this winter, like the post production start getting up to normal level, you know. But maybe not even till next uh, next spring or something I don't know um, uh, yeah I, I really uh, I I, don't don't envy people that are only post right now you know uh, yeah. the, the, the people I talk to they're busy so is, is everything to to rewrite from zero also about the new the, the new ideas in, especially in commercial and other stuff like this yes because i know many people uh, we are talking about about this are super super small crew now mm -hmm. the project with 100 people yes. now are in yeah. 10 20 people so it's everything yeah. to redesign to for sure from zero. i i i was i'm involved with a with a uh, it's palm doors uh, two years ago for a movie called the square and he's doing a new movie now called uh, The Triangle of Sadness, um, which I think is going to be amazing. Um, but I, I'm supervising there and uh, along with uh, a Danish supervisor called Peter Jort. Uh, I'm the main uh, on-set supervisor and he'll be the main uh, overall supervisor and taking care of post and so on. And also there's a... Uh, a good friend of mine called Alex Lepper, Zeppelin, uh, who is taking care of the post. So, but that uh, shoot, we were supposed to get Woody, Woody Harrelson onto the set, uh, but because of COVID, it wasn't possible. Uh, now they've shot that, uh, and so it meant that I couldn't even supervise that shoot. You know, there wasn't any VFX supervising. So, uh, but I, I briefed. My uh, a good person, Vincent, uh, Vincent Larson from uh, Tint, uh, who is the post production coordinator, and he he did a great job, like he always does. Um, uh, um, I briefed him on on what to do and so on, and and was just stand by on the phone and and so on. Um, but um, I would I would say that like in in general. The biggest thing that's really sprung up in terms of workflow is that everybody wants to know more and investigate virtual production. 
So like the volume for Mandalorian, if I, if you're familiar with that, uh, the LED screen uh, uh, states that uh, Mandalorian made um, uh, that that's like a whether where they use the Unreal Engine to basically just workflow that kind of setup. It, everybody is like wants to investigate that everybody wants to have a chance to work like that because that means that you don't have to travel you can you don't have to come to Iceland you can actually call me I can scan it I can do some HDRs and you can then light and put in this scene and you'll get this absolutely correct lighting it's pretty amazing to see actually and um and yeah you I mean it if you watch the Mandalorian uh, I'll you know that it's really amazing how good it looks. You know, so uh, so that's a very big new. And I'm involved with one project where we're looking at um, making a, a, a VP studio. It's, it's evolving also so fast. Yeah, very, very. In exactly. the, in the yeah. last ten years, it's changed really a lot of things. Yeah, and like the screen manufacturers, for example, they don't even understand it really. There's one manufacturer that makes the best screens, and uh, my my uh, tech friend that builds these sets t tells me that they don't even have a clue why it's the best screen. They, like yeah. he knows, and and the professional knows, but they it was just by chance that they actually made this the best screen, you know. And now they're working with them to to maybe improve uh, almost. It's a, what I really like about the VP uh, approach now is it reminds me of VFX around 2000, you know. It's very creative, it's very open, people are trying all kinds of things. You know, it's a little bit sky's the limit um, attitude in it, which I like. I mean, it's refreshing because VFX is very defined now. It is best practices for everything. Thing really, uh, even though you can, of course, improve, and there's always new stuff to kind of figure out. But 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 otherwise, it's like okay, you want to do this, then it's probably best to have a green screen, and we'll do we'll shoot this this way, and all that, you know. So so we have kind of a not a manual, but at least a guide to how to do things, you know. So. Yeah. Um, that's not really there at the moment with the VP, although the Mandalorian may be made like a prototype that everybody is is looking at as, as the as the bar now to um, set your sights on, you know. So okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm reading some question. We have several questions. We will try to reply challenging thing in the VFX and also mm -hmm. the most challenged project ever you did and one peanut how does editor and VFX work I am they work together uh, VFX editor uh, I mean it's different from facilities to facilities but mainly the VFX editors in charge of of, give, of, of sourcing your material and giving you your shots and so on and, and making sure everything is correct there and so color space and of course the time codes in and out are correct Every, all, all of that stuff and, uh, and uh, it's kind of like an advanced online editor I would say um, and, that, and of course it becomes sometimes an absolute versioning hell or not sometimes, almost always it becomes a versioning hell. It's so many versions, so many shots, and so on. Um, but I would say the effects editor also may be the most kind of creative part of that is maybe, you know, where he's involved in, in coming up with the cut for some sequences, maybe, you know, maybe fully... CT sequences which hasn't haven't been defined and so on. Uh, so that's almost then you're almost in an offline editor uh, role, you know. 
I work, actually, I wouldn't say that. I actually worked in China. You, you can see now that's actually from the production in China. It was two months there. And the whole time we had two on-set editors. And they were actually just VFX editors, but they were... Uh, this is something that the Chinese do a lot, is have these on-set editors, uh, which I really love, you know, because, uh, to be honest, we were working with a extremely uh, unstructured uh, director, to say the least, you know, and we were shooting almost blind a lot of the time. And when you're shooting a complete CG scene with a couple of actors in in, in green screen, uh, you need to, you know, have something to work with. So the uh, onset editors were were absolute uh, lifesavers there for sure, um, but but yeah, I mean the effects much on the, how the job is or if it's a good job or not. I mean, I think if you are a very technical editor, I think it's probably quite an interesting job. Uh, if you are very creative editor, it's probably not the best editing job you can get. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, good advice. Because mm -hmm. I'm rating golden advice. I will ask you at the end of all. Mm -hmm. Golden advice for uh, an 18 guy. I read uh, something in this way. This is really up for also. Mm -hmm. uh, Another yeah. question. Yeah. How the lighting affects the VFX of a film? You talked the, mm -hmm. before about the lighting. If mm -hmm. you wanna... I think just in general, I mean, really, there's two, as you, there's maybe for me, and I'm even talking as a fan, like three of the most common giveaways for for VFX, like where you where you're supposed to not see it but then you see it is the is lighting number one when the lighting's off because are more sensitive in this way than other people but in general i think this is one one of the biggest um, uh, categories where where we all fail as filmmakers is when when the uh, onset lighting and the post lighting is not matching or or, or even if just even if it's matching, but it's just it, it doesn't make sense, you know. Like you wouldn't like a real scene like that, or or whatever, you know. Uh, another thing is animation. Like animation is often uh, with big CG sequences. It's often a giveaway for me, at least. Um, uh, I, I I absolutely prefer motion capture whenever possible to animation. Um, even though oh, I can really appreciate good animation, that uh, that's not uh, the issue really. It's just most of the time I'm not going for a performance. I'm going for replicating reality. You know, so uh, that's why I all. Um, but um, uh, and then the third thing is maybe staging. So I can give you an example, like uh, like uh, you you see a scene that's supposed to like a fight in a huge desert, and it's like a huge open plain or something. But the two guys that are fighting, they keep walking in the same two meter circle, you know. So then you really, oh, they're in a small studio, you know, and it's screen screen, and that this is what they have to work with, you know. So, which doesn't make sense for that fight in this big environment, you know. So, so uh, it's, and uh, people are, are definitely thinking about this more today. It's important to have, have the freedom of movement to sell, sell these things as well you know so both for the camera and also for the actors and and uh, vehicles and so on you know so 
I have a question from a music video director, friends, from yeah. the, uh, the filmmakers who are education. And uh, uh, he would love to know what's the most crucial part of the process in creating a convincing VFX short. Mm, the, the, I would say the planning and execution of the, of the shoots, the, the, the capture, you know. If that's successful, then you then you have it. Then you like it's like cooking, you know. If if you have a bad piece of meat, but it's never gonna get to like be really spectacular compared to if you get some some absolutely great uh, a great uh, uh, piece of ribeye or whatever whatever you are cooking, you know. So I say the same here. If if you're captured like a common thing, let's say you're shooting many layers and you're shooting them not at the same time and stuff like this, uh, and something uh, is wrong with the perspectives of the layers, that's something you can you can try and and minimize that error in in post, and you can. Maybe do some things uh, like maybe exaggerate the, the depth of fields or whatever. Um, but in general, you're you're stuck with this burnt into your pixels. This two diff two non-matching perspectives, you know. So that's a very common uh, problem, you know. Um, so yeah. I just pinned another one I received also in the comment for the result. Are you honest? Uh, yeah, I think I understand this. So it means like what's... I honestly... I, I think I, if I understand the question correctly, he's asking what part money do you need? What part, you know, planning, execution? skill and so on um, I, I I would say like you need the money that you need and like so so the bigger productions you get involved with the less you have to fight for the money simply because they know they trust you they say okay if he's saying this that's because this is what we need to do you know so we need to do this and to do this it's gonna cost this you know so so then, okay, maybe we try and make some deals and make get some discounts, you know. Maybe, okay, we're going to have the helicopter for two days. Give us a good discount or, or something, you know. Uh, um, but in general, you don't have to, uh, you don't have to uh, spend time or effort in convincing people that they have to do this and um, uh and and they won't be thinking about what can we, what's an alternative, but the smaller the production gets with this and go into unknown territory. So I would say, like money-wise, it it costs what it costs. You you you're not doing yourself a favor. So yeah. um, so that so the if we take. For example, the dragon scene in, in uh, Game of Thrones uh, season eight. Um, I basically I scan that environment, the complete environment, and I deliver that, and and that environment is then goes to vendors who then do camera animation for that environment, and so on. I mean, before that, there's a pre like I did a scan in the summertime of this location. That was used for previous, so the whole thing was completely planned in advance. We went with the helicopter. That was actually me and Stefan uh, Fangmeier, another of the top supervisors at, at HBO. And, um, and we went, uh, and Stefan and Ali uh, shot the, the plates at that point, which is like the, the point of view plates from the dragons, and also... Also, when you're chasing the dragon and stuff like this, but then my scan also they film out various plates that they need, you know. So they use my scans to make flight uh, 
flight paths uh, themselves, you know, extra stuff and wider shots and stuff like that, which which we didn't have from the from the shot over in the helicopter. Um, so I don't do the animation. The the company that does does the dragons is uh, Image Eight Engine, and that's actually the chief lighter of the dragons is actually a great friend of mine called Ruff. Ruff, if you're watching, hey, um, a friend's uh, TD, a very uh, talented guy who was working here in Iceland. Uh, and we worked together on Everest, um, the Mount Everest movie. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. 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 And that movie, I was working for Tade uh, Anderson, which I told you about, which were the Aaron and Tade who kind of uh, got my interest Amazing. going. And, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so it's a, that also shows you how small a world it is because then me and Raf, we just go do our own thing, but we end up, I end up capturing the environment that the dragons are gonna uh, fly, fly in with my own company. And he ends up being wor working in Canada, uh, lighting the, the dragons and look developing the dragons and so on, you know, so. So it is a small world. It's a surprisingly small world uh, uh, when you get into the business. Uh, you keep meeting your friends again and again. Uh, There's another one question from Galina. Mm -hmm. You know? Yes, what I know. Was the Hi, Galina. Yeah, she's super. Yeah, she what is. was the balance between VFX and set elements that were shot through to the show? Uh, so if we take, for example, the, uh, the, uh, scene where Jon Snow uh, flies the dragons, uh, so the, all the, uh, on the ground stuff is a location in Iceland, which we shot. So all the landscape there, that's the landscape. That's an actual location that you see there. Uh, the only thing that's added there is the dragon and and some of the bones. The the the, the bone which you see my scan. I, I've I've sent you a video of the scan of that that bone nest that they have there. That was there in the in the takes as well. But then they multiplied the bones as well, and and they used some of the bones for them to bite on and and throw away and stuff like that I, like what whatever they do there because they weren't there the, the bones are not going to be animated of course they're just lying as as a dress thing on the set you know so so that part is is all uh, real you know uh, but they mm -hmm. but they when they face the dragons then they of course like they're in the real environment but they're standing they're, they're facing them on a green screen and the dragons are then inserted between the real environment and and the uh, and the actors. Um, okay. Once they fly off, then we're in a computer game territory, you know. Then it's all CT basically. But uh, I say that, uh, but they actually shoot, of course, they shoot uh, the actors on the very famous dragon uh, uh, rodeo uh, machine that they have a green screen rodeo machine which they shoot the actors on and then there then then and all of that is planned out to to perfection so everything lines up with all the camera moves and all that you know so so um yeah so the actors are actually real actors in some cases they are maybe doubles, but for the most part it's going to be real actors on green screen sitting on the dragons but the rest of the images than uh, CT all the way. Oh, uh, yeah, well, I say that again. Mm -hmm. Of course, when we're using the plates, then it's plates, but but apart from, so, so it's never it's never an in-camera thing, uh, is what I'm trying to say, maybe. From, from when they fly off, it's all done in, it's all uh, states in, the, in, in Nuke, in a comp, you know, so, uh, yeah. Okay, we. Uh, I'm reading some comments. We already reply, uh, replied about teamwork, about the relationship with different 
uh, roles. So you guys, you will find everything on the YouTube channel after this live. We will add it and uh, you can find everything because we are screen recording also because uh, mm. we know that Typhoon without any advice <laughs> sometimes <laughs> crash. I, I'm really taking fun, but it's crazy. We're still not switching to Android, are we? No. Yeah. This is Android. I can't oh, show okay. the stuff now. This is Android okay. now. Okay. Because uh, he the said yeah, yeah. you can't use because the, the temperature is so high. So I can't use iPhone yet. Mm. So there's some question about software, best software. Which software do you suggest? Which software do you use in your workflow? And, uh, and yeah, if you want to quickly... Yeah, I mean, I've, I've used them. basically most of them. Uh, I mean, my, I, I do all my... I, I do a lot of planning and a lot of work and like I do a lot of um, post vis and pre vis and all this stuff in, in uh, Nuke Studio. Um, and of course, I do a lot of comping still myself, uh, but not usually not for these big productions, but for more for Icelandic films, for example, and stuff like this and commercials. But um, yeah, so Nuke is you have to, if you want to be in the 2D uh, world of, of VFX, you have to know Nuke, you know. Um, Fusion is also quite capable. Um, uh i i used fusion for many years at one point and and loved it um the only thing i would kind of say with fusion is that it it maybe uh kind of leads you down a little bit of a uh it kind of it doesn't it's a little bit deceiving how how the actual uh science of compositing is you know it's all there but it's a little bit more many like for example the the layer tool in in uh, fusion is a merge it's called merge i think as uh, as best i remember and you do that and when you merge you have a layer with with a transform so you can move your layer and you can scale it and rotate it and all that which is quite normal if you're thinking layers as in Premiere or Photoshop or whatever, but as a, when you get into pretty high level compositing, this kind of stuff can annoy you a little bit because it's it's the 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 operation of layering is is a very specific mathematical procedure, and uh, it's very nice to just see that in your note graph then you know that's the only mathematic procedure that's going on. And then you see a transform node next to that. And then you know, okay, there's a transform as well. So, you know, because okay. when it's packaged into one node, it can be difficult to find these, let's say, a sliding, like your track is not working now because there's a, there's a offset in some transform that's making it slide or there's a keyframe that's making it slide and then you have to dig down to all these tools to try and find it whereas in nuke you would see okay here are all the transforms and i can see this transform is animated and so on you know so so when you get into very high and complex compositing you really want things to be very nuclear as we say or atomic so it's very basic elements really um you don't want to have so much of a uh, high level tools where they pack a lot of stuff into one note representation you know um, because that makes it difficult to find when you have hundreds of notes you know so um, and also it also is not helpful for you to start understanding the math of compositing I mean compositing is amazingly math based and and quite simple math really so so once you've composited for many years you really it really clicks in your head and you at least for me uh, like i'm pretty good at at uh, at simple math in my head i'm pretty good at that you know so so when i'm reading a note graph i actually kind of read it in in a little bit of a mat mathematical sense as well you know especially with keying and stuff 
I would like keying for me, math, like the math of the compositing is quite important. So, um, yeah. Okay, I'm reading similar question. Guys, you can find film school, college. We talked already at the beginning of this live. You can find everything. The link is in bio. You can subscribe. And in a couple of days, we will drop the edit of this live. Just today, come up the new URSA 12K resolution. How important is the right camera, in your, in your opinion, for the VFX? I mean, uh, who, who, who announced this 12K camera? Uh, Black Magic. Okay. New Ursa Mini. Oh, yeah, okay. it's the period of a uh, big announcement. Yeah, yeah. Can you uh, get out with their 5 8K resolution? Mm. There's a Sony, end of July, with the i7 III, but this is the, the yeah. pro camera yeah. of I, the... I mean, I, I used to, like, be very much into all the camera news and all that, you know, it's... It's less of a thing for me now. Of course, I just keep up to what I uh, stuff that I need to know, of course. Um, but resolution-wise, I would say we've reached plenty of resolution for movie making a long time ago, actually. You know, 4K, you know, if you have super high resolving lenses on a, on a good 4K sensor, you, you'll get crazy good resolution and actually you'll get too much sharpness for for film because yeah. what people often forget is like a filmic look is a lot of motion blur and actually quite soft images that yeah. we're used to we're used to seeing like uh, historically we're mm -hmm. used to seeing 2k film stock shot at, with a 180 shutter uh, at 24 frames with all of that is quite low fidelity compared to what we're doing today. Um, so our um, filmic language and our filmic sensibility is very much connected. Like if you take the motion blur away, for example, Hobbit was a, a, a movie that was too close to 50p, which we used to watch some, some broadcast in that kind of, like with the interlaced in the old, old days, like you had 25 interlaced, which meant that you actually were, it looked, it looked like what 50p can look like, you know, so, and you have no, if you have too little motion blur and stuff, it becomes really with video and, and fakey looking for us, you know, so, so uh, filmmakers today are very aware of the, the cast look amazing, you know, and it's, and it's very good for him. He, it was on a Russian arm, you know, so, so it's, I, I wouldn't like, I, I would, the, the other side of that is as a tool, as a utility, as, as a tool for me, a 12K camera can be amazing, like oh, unbelievable, because then I can do stuff, you know, I can put a 180 uh, field of view lens on it, a fisheye with a 180, and I actually have a lot of resolution in that, in that, 180 uh, field of view, you know, uh, whereas before that 12K camera, I would maybe be looking at taking two 6K cameras or, or three 6K cameras because I could get the field of view that I wanted, but it would then be sampled down to two little resolution and so on. So yeah. as, as a tool, it's amazing. Like you yeah, said, with yeah. the R5, I just today I pre-ordered my R5, you know, because as a tool, it's amazing. You know, I can now. It's small. Yeah. It's also small for what you are doing on the helicopter. Exactly. But it's the second. The, uh, it's perfect for scanning. It's got in body yeah. stabilization. It's got the new RF lenses, which are crazy high resolving. It's light. I can travel with a very, with a smaller kit now. Um, I can, uh, I can shoot my own almost my own second unit elements on this camera, you know, if uh, I'm sure that I'll be doing a lot of that, you know, uh, that I won't be u yeah. using an ARRI on a, a RET, you know, I'll just do it on my Canon, you know, for smoke, yeah, yeah. smoke, uh, fire, water, all this kind of stuff that we shoot uh, as elements uh, just on a black background or whatever. 
I'll just do it on my own camera, you know. So yeah. that that that's a huge thing. But for the final, for the final creative thing we've reached, uh, I mean, I say that, but then also, you know, I love watching 4K Dolby Vision movies, you know. It's, it, they, it looks amazing uh, when it's mastered properly, you know. So maybe it's changing also, but our historic connection to film it's very important to have the motion blur. It's very important to yeah. to have the grain when the look is like that. It's very important to have all of that stuff. For the know. narrative, for everything. Yeah, for, 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 for the, the emotional movie. connection with yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. This is another big topic because, <laughs> yeah, it's a technical side, but you have to... You need to have a wide <laughs> yeah, amount yeah. of experience, of yeah. knowledge, mixing different paths because uh, you, you can't <laughs> what, be what? focused only on your side when you work on a big big project with a lot of things to respect to no i think my, my experience is the 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 more like the the more i advance in 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 my uh, career uh, the the more important it becomes to to be a passionate filmmaker uh, to to understand narrative to want to say a good story to to be a kid with a direct and just get yeah. ideas and and uh, like so so you have to get all this technical stuff in and you do that and at some point you start becoming not comfortable but you're you're you know that you're okay with like you even though you don't know exactly how it's going to be, you know that you've been in this situation a hundred times before, you're going to find a solution for it. Yeah. You know, uh, you feel okay technically. Um, then you start freeing up for, uh, for, the, for the artistic side, which uh, uh, super, uh, VFX, super, I mean, I, for me, it's a big problem with many VFX supervisors. They are not, artistic enough in my view you know and and i i often get that response from directors and producers that they've had the experiences with very very technical uh exclusively technical kind of di uh, uh, vfx directors you know uh, vfx supervisors um so i i think I, I also like a basic thing is like the the further the mo more amazing people you get to work with and 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 uh, and the more amazing projects you get to involve the more you r realize and see how important it is just to be kind just to be a a nice person you know it's Absolutely. it's it's a very it's a big myth about hollywood that everybody that's a success in hollywood is an asshole it's absolutely not true of course, Absolutely. there is, of course, prima donnas and there is, of course, the famous actor that takes a fit and all that. But also, on the other hand, it's, it's extremely difficult to be an actor involved in filmmaking, to have to, you know, try and, and get your head in a, in a certain space while people are changing the lights. And, you know, every, so it's, it's a, a lot of pressure on everybody. So you really i really don't blame anybody that kind of loses their mind for a second or two you know that's I, I think that's absolutely understandable but the thing is that the more comfortable people are in filmmaking the, of course the less stressed they are the nicer they become but also at, on the same hand the 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 more of a demand they make to you of being a nice person you know and being being an on honest person, being a hardworking person, and being a nice person. I mean, that's my best advice to everybody out there is just like, be honest yeah. and work hard, you know, and, and never be afraid of, to say that you don't understand or that you made a mistake or whatever, you know, always just be honest, you know, so. Golden advice. Yeah. I, I, I would love to ask at the end, but it's perfect what yeah. you said. It's so important because especially with social media, people dream a lot, mm -hmm. Hollywood people dream a lot. Mm -hmm. Don't think like we said before, 
only numbers, money, big budget, yeah. it's easy on big budget, only things, wrong things, because a long time journey is made by different things. You have to serve the team, the whole team, especially in a big, big project. Thanks so much for all those advices. About the relationship, guys, Veronica, also we already uh, explained it at the beginning of this live. I'm reading also question about the gears. This is not the, the topic of this uh, live. We are talking about the effects. And I pinned a question, thought on stagecraft technology as used in Mandalorian. You already talked mm -hmm. a bit about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm not uh, I'm not an expert on that, but uh, a good friend of mine was in, in, involved with that uh, build, uh, uh, Chris Co Cox. Uh, maybe you're watching, Chris. Hi, if you are. Um, he uh, he was involved in that, and and like um, uh, I don't know what to say other than for the big thing is that the screens have enough they're good enough quality now. And, and bright enough to be light sources in addition to being back project. Oh, yeah, it is back projection, but it's just projection, I would say now, because it's its own, it's LED projection now. Um, um, uh, that they're good enough to be the location and also be the light source. So you really, you can light a scene just with the screens which means that you can, as a VFX guy, I can use the same HDR for my CG stuff as I'm using in studio for this. So it's gonna match lighting wise, absolutely 100%. Of course, what you always wanna do is add your little spots and creative lighting as well, you know, but to have the, 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 the main environmental lighting absolutely the same source as both is, is an amazing thing for us. And, and like all the headaches with reflections and stuff like this, which you deal with in, uh, in green screens and spill and all that, that's just gone. Now it's all, all the right stuff. What's reflected is what's supposed to be reflected, you know. What's spilling is the light that's supposed to spill, you know. So um, that kind of... Uh, that that's uh, like a real game changer in my mind, and and I, I don't know what to say other than, of course, uh, Favaro, uh, the director, um, uh, started this journey on on uh, on the Jungle Book uh, production, where he kind of did the first implementations of this kind of virtual uh, production uh, workflow, and then they just. It kind of perfected it for Mandalorian and and, uh, and uh, the big thing there is also like using the Unreal Engine a real time engine so that you have all the right perspectives <clears throat> you can even have the you can even uh, uh, replicate the, the depth of field uh, and so on you know so uh, so that makes it really powerful stuff, you know. But even even as a, even as just projecting uh, plates, you know, which you can't mess about with the perspective where the perspective would be fixed, it's still really powerful compared to a green screen, you know, because it's still the light coming in, lighting your subject. So um, uh, yeah, I'm I'm very excited about that stuff. Uh, it might. It's going to probably mean that uh, a lot of uh, green screen, uh, we're going to do a lot less green screen work, but it's it's not going away. I mean, even for the Mandalorian, they had like a green screen on the projection anyway, because it's, it wasn't holding up in some shots. You know, it, the, the, the game engine was too rough. The screens were too rough for a close up or whatever. So then they just pop in the green screen and then they comp it afterwards. But the green screen, it's just a little square around your actor. And then the rest of the environment is the right, correct lighting, you know. So he's really super well, well integrated lighting-wise. Uh, 
And this, uh, this is always the, the, I mean, we've known it forever, that lighting, how important lighting is. But <clears throat> for each step that we improve lighting, it, it always amazes you how, how really crucial lighting is. You, know? you can almost get away with complete, uh, un uh, completely unbelievable things if it's just lit really perfectly, you know. If it's lit perfectly, you'll believe the most unbelievable thing uh, in the frame, you know. So, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I told you, Veronica, we already talked about this. Don't don't take it personal. We are replying, I think, the, the last one question. Do you usually work in prep road plus on set or prep road only happens also? No, I, I, I'm usually involved quite early um, in, in prep, yeah. In pre, even, uh, you know, you have pre and then you have prep. Uh, so, and sometimes I'm involved before financing, you know, I'm sometimes helping with them getting the funding as well. So, um, you, yeah, you know, you just okay. step in, you step in where you think you can be of use, basically. And it, it seems to be all over the place. So, yeah. Okay. Next goal challenges project, if it's possible to, to say, to know. What my next personal goal is or what? Is, is Personal, that... and if you can anticipate something or newest works. Oh, next, uh, yeah. So I, I mean, what, um, I've I've got uh, three movies now, uh, which I'm supervising, and uh, probably the 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 one that's going to be out the first is going to be uh, the Triangle of Sadness, the new. Uh, open uh, Östlund um, film. Um, I highly recommend everything he's done. Um, he's absolutely amazing, I think. Uh, it's been amazing working with him. Um, um, so that's... Uh, it's a real film. It's a, It falls under art house film. It's... it's probably going to compete for the Cannes uh, Awards. Um, but R Ruben is a very, very funny guy and he has his own very spe specific humor and um, it's in all of his films where he he kind of, uh, how can he, he kind of uh, loves... Uh, laughing at the misery of the Busasi, you can say, or like everyday normal middle-class problems that like become uncontrollably big is kind of something he just loves uh, working with and doing funny stuff with, you know? So, so um, I'm like, there was stuff I saw on set which was just like this, uh, like blew my mind, you know? So, uh, I'm very much looking forward to seeing that. And I can highly recommend that you try and see it when it comes out. Um, uh, other things, I mean, I, I I wouldn't say I have anything kind of specific. Now I'm starting to work a lot in Scandinavia, um, which is maybe my focus now is to develop those um, relationships more, more you know. Uh, um, I am working on... on uh, also, maybe expand, get, getting back to doing more posts myself here in Reykjavik. Uh, that's a project that might uh, develop and, and uh, be exciting for sure. Um, uh, Movie-wise, I don't know really. Uh, um, I mean, uh, I, I am... I, I am involved with the season two of Mandalorian. For me, that's uh, the most maybe exciting kind of, like that's a credit as to have a star wars credit is amazing i think um and i'm very excited about that and especially because i'm working for with joe Bayer and for joe, joe bauer again who was the uh head supervisor of game of thrones so um 
Uh, but also I'm working with Ted Ray from Game of Thrones as well on a Netflix series. So, so you know, I'm super happy about that, actually, how, how we're staying um, in touch and still working together. I was quite sad when Game of Thrones stopped, you know, because... It's, it... it's clear that you are more passionate than more young guys. <laughs> you, you think so? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I, 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 I'm privileged now, you know, I've... I've been there's been many many days and weeks where i wanted to quit this business you know when i was younger now i'm kind of like it's not a business anymore it's just who i am you know yeah, so yeah. Uh, there's no quitting you know it's like quitting who you are you can't do that absolutely so yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um but I, I don't know i like doing more stuff in europe i did a commercial in italy that was great i would love to do another one um, you know, I, I I don't mind doing commercials, for example. I think that's often a lot of fun. Uh, they're quite intense, actually. Um, uh, I, yeah, I, I try not to focus on anything. I just try to be open, see like something comes and and you know go on an adventure. You know, I uh, I was really excited about China after working there. You know, even though working there is extremely difficult. Uh, but just China as a as a country really blew my mind. Um, but now so many things have happened that it's not really, you know, as COVID, uh, like the industry is really bad shape, the film industry and, and uh, all the COVID stuff, it kind of, it's a little bit impossible right now. So, but we have to stay positive for the outcome. Of course, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, yeah. For the new year, because... Uh, we, yeah, we no. can live in this way. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> it's not our life. No, I'm sure that everything. I mean, it maybe sounds like a cliche and like I don't mean it or whatever, but I'm pretty sure that this yeah, whole yeah. this this whole thing is gonna make for for better everything, better work, better, better societies, better. But it's Absolutely. it's difficult now for sure. So. But we, we will go more strong after, the, yeah. after this. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, I agree. Yeah. 100%. <clears throat> I'm, not, I'm not seeing new questions. So if you want to add something, we, we talked over one, year, one hour. Yeah, I think it's pretty good. One, one hour and 20 minutes or something. That's yeah, pretty good. Yeah. I, I think maybe people are sick of me by now. So uh... We lost some viewers <laughs> for the first but uh, but but well, I, no, I'm just I just just want to thank you and it's been really lovely. You really do an amazing job. You have an amazing amazing account, uh, and I I love uh, how you how you do your stuff. You know, I'm dead impressed. So thank you for uh, having me. You know, I would love to come back sometime and and uh, yeah. Maybe. Thanks so much to you. Yeah. We are so honored and uh, we love, as I told you every time, uh, we love to share normal people mm. that become big because this is the example we want to share to the young guys. Yeah. That every day, Diana is asking every kind of, of suggestion. We will keep going, sharing this kind of live experience because it's so important. Mm -hmm. And yeah, for sure, Veronica, you can you can find the reply in the YouTube link in bio on the YouTube. We are editing this live in a few days and you can find also the reply about the different role, the relationship we talked about at the beginning. So, Hori, thanks so much again, really. Thanks everyone to, for watching, also the one that uh, rejoined the live and uh, and yeah, Thank let's you. stay in touch and uh, maybe soon we, we also meet in some... Yeah, that would some be place. great, so definitely. Maybe I come to Rome and do a commercial, right? Absolutely, <laughs> keep me posted. I will, I will, take care, bye. Thanks so much again, take care you too, bye-bye. Bye-bye to everyone.